Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome, Roxy. So I'm Erin, a partner at Lyft Economy, and my guest today is Roxy Manning. Roxy's life experience as an Afro-Caribbean immigrant to the U.S. combined with her academic training and professional work as a licensed clinical psychologist and Center for Nonviolent Communication certified trainer have cultivated a deep passion in her for work that supports social change at the personal, interpersonal, and systemic levels. She is a trainer with Bay NBC. She's a lead consultant with the Center for Efficient Collaboration and assessor in training with CNBC. And she is delighted whenever she is helping opposing voices hear each other and see past individual hurt and struggles to the structures that contribute to those challenges. And you can visit her website, RoxanneManning.com, to read her articles and view training videos of her teaching. I'm so thrilled to welcome you to the show, Roxy, because I've learned so much from your work. And I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about your background to start. Well, first, I'm delighted to be here. I so enjoy working with you and really am grateful for what your organization does And in terms of my background, I actually find it's most meaningful when people say, what would you like to know about me? So is there some specific aspect about my background that would be meaningful for you to hear about? Is there a moment in your life that really created this drive in you to work on communication and compassion? Because so many people come to this work from many different angles. And what drew you to compassionate communication and what drew you to, to this type of work? Great question. You've already mentioned that I'm an immigrant to the United States. And one of the challenges I had was, and I'm African American or Black American, so not knowing how to balance what it means to be an Afro-Caribbean immigrant and then what the United States makes of Black people. And for the longest time, the way that I dealt with that was that I had a real lack of self-compassion. I always seemed to have a lot of compassion for other people because I really internalized the sense that we're all intrinsically good. But the way that I made sense of the world was if people are doing all of these things to me that are really painful or not seeing me or in some ways denying my capacities, there must be something wrong with me. So that you could imagine was just hugely, hugely at this point, heartbreaking and also just so limiting in terms of what I could do. And struggled through grad school and had the most amazing professor, Jane Connor, who was the person who encountered nonviolent communication first. And she came to me one day and said, Roxy, I've got this most wonderful thing. And she was super excited about it. And she said, you have got to learn this because you are so disconnected from your needs. And I was like, huh, I have no idea what she means by that, <laughs> right? Disconnected from my needs. But then I realized that I had lived a life of always putting other people's needs first, always putting what's important to other people first, and always trying to take care of other people first. And at the point when she said this to me, I had two children, and I realized I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want my children going up thinking, this is the way that you can be successful as a Black person in America. That started, that was kind of the jump start for me to start exploring this work and thinking there's got to be something different. And then the other part of that is I've always been an activist, like even when I was relatively small. And in college, I joined the Young Socialist Workers Party. And one of the things that I noticed was that there was a lot of tension between the folks who are on the Young Socialist Party and the students in the school that I was attending, Howard University, which is one of the historically black colleges. And part of it was that the Young Socialist Workers Party was mostly white folks. And the students at Howard were mostly African American, and they didn't see each other. Even though they were wanting the same thing, they were wanting kind of societal transformation, they couldn't see each other. And so I was always looking for a way, and this partly drew me to psychology initially, to find how can we get to see each other so that we can actually come together and be more effective in the work that we do. Wow. Amazing story. Thank Mm. you so much for sharing. 
I'm so curious, how did it feel when your professor came to you? Do you remember <laughs> how it felt when she kind of called you in to this? Yeah. Hey, you're not, you don't know what your needs are. How did that feel? I think really just surprised and bemused because I, I truly had no idea what she meant. Part of not actually attending to my needs was almost not even recognizing or acknowledging that I had them. So even that was a kind of awakening, like needs, what's that? <laughs> my son used to say the saying, like needs, what's the meaning of this strange word needs, right? <laughs> And it was the same thing. It was literally a strange concept to me that I would have needs that needed to be attended to. And I imagine a lot of our listeners may be resonating right now. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the systems at play that yeah. are causing so many people to ignore their needs. Yeah. So there are two thoughts that I'm having. There's this really amazing philosopher, an African-American philosopher, one of the very few black female philosophers in this country named Aisha Cherry. And she talks about racial rules. And some of the racial rules are, at least in the United States, are that we prioritize the needs of white people first. It's part of what this country was founded on. And that's one of those systemic pieces that are in play. Being successful, being welcomed in a lot of settings when I was growing up meant that I had to take care of what white folks found important, like what their standard of beauty was. I had to buy into that. I had to accept all of the stories about the neighborhoods that I lived in that were, I lived in Harlem when I was growing up, so a predominantly black neighborhood. I had to really accept a lot of the framing of what it meant to be black and what it meant to be white in the United States. States. And as somebody who is female identified, same thing, right? There are a lot of rules about what it means to be a woman and how you should be showing up. And, and part of those rules are taking care of other people, right? Women are really taught that to be a good mother, you need to be the person who's sacrificing, who's balancing work and home. And so there were so many different confluences that led me to think that the only way that I could be successful was to follow all of these unspoken rules and learn how to put other people first. Thank you so much for bringing that African-American philosopher to our reader's attention and for really vulnerably sharing these pieces that are at play. And I know you are just about to conclude a workshop with Sarah Payton, who we've also had on the podcast. And it's such a an incredible workshop title. I just want to, I'd love for you to share a little bit about the workshop is all about using self-compassion to counter white supremacy. And given what you just shared about these race rules and how powerful they are in really our lives, what would you say to listeners about this course and why self-compassion as a counter to white supremacy? Oh, yes. So for me, self-compassion and compassion are the only counters that I think will be effective in the long run. One of the things that is important to me is Kingian nonviolence. And so this idea that as we're doing this work, we're wanting to create beloved community. Changing the systems that we have, to me, will not be a success if all I've done is flip who's on top, right? If we still have systems where someone's on top and someone's suffering. So that's not my goal at all. And so in order to make the kind of change that I want, where we're all really seeing each other's full humanity and attending to the needs for everyone. I need to be able to see a white person as human. I need to be able to see the pain and the struggle and the rules that they're following unconsciously that are leading them to show up in ways that are harmful, that are denying the experiences, the needs of people from other ethnicities. In order to do that, there are a number of steps that we need to take. Individually, we need to be able to look at the ways that we've shown up. First, I mentioned how I bought into a lot of those rules, right? And you could imagine that realizing like I was buying into and in some ways enforcing some of those rules, that's tragic. It's like there's such sh shock. And in some ways, we can start to feel almost self-disgust when we realize how complicit we've been in these systems, and so being able to feel self-compassion, to hold ourselves with care, and still invite us to do something differently is really important to be able to create effective change. If I don't hold self-compassion for myself, if I'm judging myself, then I'm also going to be judging all of those white folks out there. I'm also going to be judging folks who are not showing up in the way that I am. If I'm further along on the path of trying to create this change, then I start to judge the people who are not as far along on the path also, right? Even if they're in my group. And so self-compassion is a way to say, I understand why you're taking the actions that you're taking. 
I understand what's motivating you. And I want to mourn with you that you're not able in this moment to find a different strategy to meet your needs. And I want to help you find a different one. Let's work together to find a more effective, less costly way to achieve your goals. And that's what self-compassion does. I'm recognizing that there may be listeners to this podcast who maybe have bad connotations <laughs> with NBC or bad experiences. So I'm curious, what is your definition of nonviolent communication, Roxy? And, and how would you encourage people to hold that, that whole body of work? That's such a complicated question. And I would definitely suggest, I don't want to go into it right now, but I would definitely invite your listeners to go to my website and read some of the work that I've posted there that's really exploring some of the challenges with nonviolent communication, because I want to acknowledge that there have been challenges for some folks. But for me, the way that I'm holding nonviolent communication is that it's really just a framework that helps me connect to the full humanity of each person that I encounter by understanding what's motivating them. What are the needs that they have, which are the same values that I have? So needs and values I could almost use interchangeably in this moment. What are the values that I'm holding and that they're holding that's resulting in the actions that we're taking? And how can we align on those values because we all have the same values, right? We're all wanting justice. We just have different definitions about what justice looks like. When I listened to what was happening with the Capitol Hill riots in this country, I heard some people who were at those riots saying, we want justice. So when we get to the word, we all want the same thing. We've just learned to talk about those things differently. So how do we kind of get to that deep heart of what's motivating people? And then, like I said earlier, find ways to get those needs met that are holding both of us, that are not, I'm going to get my needs met and you don't, or that you get yours needs met and I don't, that we're really creating that beloved community where all of our needs are better met. Yeah. And going back to this course, you're just wrapping up with Sarah, you talked about self-compassion and that that's almost an avenue in some ways to helping people see their needs more clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I think when we start to beat ourselves up or when we're really, for sure, when we're stuck in like all of the following all of the rules that society has set for us, we don't actually see our needs, right? Like part of the rules is I need to be successful and successful means that I need to, for a black person, adopt some of the white standards of beauty, et cetera, et cetera. So we see a lot of people changing their hair, lightening their skin, doing all sorts of things that are so tragic, right? Or consuming, 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 buying more and more and more, because that's what we've been told is success. But if I get to slow down and say, am I actually happy? What am I actually needing? Wow. When I started asking myself that question, when I encountered NVC, you know, I was on that path. I was a PhD. I was doing quite well. I could have gone into that. I'm going to charge $500 an hour for like every single thing and only see very wealthy clients, right? But instead, I said, I want my kids to grow up knowing that they matter, and I want every child to grow up knowing that they matter. And that's what's important to me. I want to live in a world where people know that they matter and that we're all working together to create that experience for everyone. And when I ask myself that, I start to have a lot of grief around the ways that I had been showing up, the ways that I wasn't able to hold myself And in some ways, the ways that luckily my children were still young, that I was starting to hold them, right? And in that grief, I needed to hold compassion for myself, some understanding about why I had made those choices and not beat myself up so much that I shut down, that I was unable to do something differently. So it's that ability to mourn and to hold self-compassion that creates the avenue for change. Mm, I'm... Feeling so much gratitude for you right now, Roxy, because I'm imagining there's a large amount of people that are very resistant to even talking about white supremacy. It's so painful to even say that word. So I'm curious, kind of, yeah, do you have experiences of working with folks who maybe just don't even want to acknowledge that it exists? Yeah, how do we use self compassion as a counter to that, even even in those moments that feel so hard? 
Oh, great question. I want to separate out because I think that question depends on who I'm working with, right? So first, I'm going to talk about working with white folks who might find a lot of pain or stimulation when they hear the word white supremacy. A big mantra for me is that I always speak to the person that I'm working with. It's not that I'm changing what I believe in, but I need to speak the language that that person's going to understand. So when people, if you're a white person and you hear white supremacy or privilege, what you're often hearing is you've done something wrong. You've showed up in a way that's toxic, that's painful, that's bad. And nobody wants to hear that. No one wants to like go, oh my gosh, I'm being judged, right? You're not seeing me. I find it's really helpful to talk more specifically, this is where NVC becomes really important, to talk really specifically about what is that person doing or saying that I might be thinking is a manifestation of white supremacy or privilege, right? So instead of saying, oh my gosh, you have privilege, I might say, gosh, I noticed that as the white man in this room, you've spoken about 40% of the time and you're one of 20 people. And I'm wondering if you're tracking that and if it matters to you to find strategies that will get other voices in. So I'm talking about a manifestation of white supremacy. I'm talking about privilege. I'm not accusing the person of anything. I'm just inviting them with me to look at this observation and think about how do you want to respond to that? What values come up for you when you see that? So that's one piece. That said, I think it is helpful to be able to name things and to say some of these patterns that we see in who's talking more and who doesn't talk is occurring because of some of these rules that are connected to white supremacy, some of these rules that are connected to patriarchy. And when we recognize that there are things that are happening that we've internalized but are not actually connected to our hearts, what we really want to do, it's a lot easier to say, Do I want to be run by this rule or do I want to be more choice about how I show up in the world? So there's something so freeing about helping people see that it's not that they're bad. It's that they've been influenced and are still running these unconscious scripts that they're not aware of. And giving that script a name, whatever name I give it, helps people to like notice when that script is is running. That's one piece. The second piece is what if I'm talking to a person of color, right? Someone from the global majority. A lot of my friends in the global majority are saying, if you can't talk about white supremacy, I don't trust you, right? If you're not willing to call it what it is, then who are you talking to? Who are you doing this for? And so this is where that idea of who am I speaking to and what's going to resonate for that person is important. When I talk to that person, I'm holding, I might say, wow, I'm guessing that you're really frustrated when you see these manifestations of white supremacy. And then I'll go on to name some of the examples in the same way that I did before, right? Like we're in this meeting where, and this was a true example, we're in this meeting that was called by um, the state government to really address um, this issue in the community. And somehow the people of color weren't invited to the planning meeting and they're the ones who are speaking the least in the room. And I'm guessing you're really tired hearing that and not trusting that the people are really getting how white supremacy is impacting the choices that they're making. So I will name it. I will talk about those things, but I will still ground it in the observation. And I still choose not to label the people as bad, not to label the people as intentionally choosing some of these things because I don't believe they are. I like this idea of an unconscious script that's running that we're not even aware of. And this was what was so powerful about Sarah's course is she really weaves in an understanding of how our brains develop concepts and run these kind of unconscious patterns because it's what our brains do as humans. We're efficient and we like to make things. Algorithms are are time-saving. Wow. Thank you, Roxy. And thank you for all the courses you imagine and dream up and birth into the world. It's (laughs) it's so exciting. There is one that you taught earlier, maybe it was earlier this year or last year around fostering better communication across folks coming from different socioeconomic and racial backgrounds. And I'm curious, what are some of the top things you're paying attention to around that topic of helping folks from from different backgrounds be better communicators? Oh, love this question. There are a couple of things that I think are super important if I want to really build connection across differences. One is that we're really clear what the conversation is that we're inviting people to. 
right? So a lot of times, like something happens, for instance, and there's urgency. As a white person, I need to show up and talk to this person, partly to show that I'm a good white person, right? To show that I get it. Or there might be, I need to show up from a person of color. I need to show up and say something because I'm not going to stand for this anymore. And all of a sudden, we're not actually having the same conversation. I'm trying to get you to realize how much pain I'm in, and you're trying to get me to see what a good person you are. So being really clear on what's the conversation that we're having here and agreeing upon that conversation is really huge. Another piece is, especially when I'm talking about conversations across different groups and where one group has less power than the other, it's helping the person with more structural power realize, how can I step back? How can I get an understanding that what I think I know is limited by what I've been exposed to? It's limited by the experiences I've had so far. And that there's a wealth of experiences that this person is likely bringing that I have no clue about, right? An example of that was I was in a relationship with somebody who was white. And I remember like little things like going to a restaurant, was in a restaurant with this person and their mother, and all three of us were talking. And at some point, you know, standing in line waiting to be seated. And at some point, the server comes up to us to seat us, the hostess, and talks to the two of them and says, hey, table for two, completely ignores me, even though I'm standing in that group talking to these three people. So this kind of unconscious assumption that maybe I was just to stand a passerby having a conversation while I was waiting for my own table. And they thought nothing of it. It was just kind of like, oh, no, it's three. And for them, it was just an easy, oh, there are three of us, no problems at all. But for me, it was like, oh, (laughs) this sense of like, once again, somehow I'm not being seen or not being seen as belonging with this group, with these folks, right? When I tried to talk to my friend about this, my partner at the time, there was a little bit of convincing that my perspective could have validity because they had never had this experience of not being included, of not being seen, even when there are others. For them, it was easy to say, oh, no, she just didn't know. It's a normal question, table for two. But for me, having this experience over and over and over again, it had a different meaning. And so this idea of what am I missing if I'm coming from the group with more power is huge. Some other things that I think would be important to notice is noticing what stories are running inside of ourselves. There's something so scary about someone calling us in, someone saying, hey, I'm not sure this thing that you just did didn't work for me, right? And that would be the nicest calling us in. And because we've all grown up, most of us, in settings where we're probably afraid of punishment, right? This idea that I don't want my mom and dad to be mad at me. So we've been conditioned to think, I've got to please people. And if there's a disconnect, something's bad, something's wrong. Even taking away the issues of race and ethnicity, we worry about, do I fit in? Do I belong? Are you okay with me? And so noticing when someone's trying to call you in and let you know that what you did didn't work for them, are you responding from a fear reaction, from I need to be seen, I need you to get my intention, I need you to see that I'm a good person, or are you able to stay with that person and say, wow, tell me more about the impact, let me understand what that was like for you, what needs were not met for you if I'm bringing in NVC, right? And to really open our hearts to the impact of that without worrying about how we're seen and whether or not we belong. And what I trust is if I can do that, if I can really stay with the person in their pain, I have a much better chance of being seen and of belonging than when I can't do that. Thank you so much for sharing those stories, Roxy. I really, really appreciate the vulnerability of sharing. So thank you. I realize also that... I'm telling stories. I tend to teach from a place of like sharing about my life, but I also have lots of workplace stories given the interview. So please do remind me to bring some in if that would be helpful for you. Well, I would love to hear some workplace stories. And it also, one story that conjured up was another personal story that you've written about in an article around how in some cases, in this one instance, you were sharing some pain that was happening for you. I think it was around your son and, and his experience. And you maybe 
I'm not sure if I'm going to, I want you to share the story <laughs> rather than me paraphrasing it. But yeah, if there are other stories that you think would be significant for our listeners around some of these topics, I'd love to hear them. A workplace story would be great. Yeah. So one of the organizations that I worked with recently, actually, they were having a really significant challenge around microaggressions in the workplace. And I think this ties back into one of the points that I was making earlier. One of the women in this, at this workplace, a woman of color, had described an incident where she had worked on a team and there was a whole team celebration. The project was over and they were doing a meeting where they were acknowledging everyone on the team. And there was a PowerPoint that had a list of everyone's name who had contributed to this presentation. And she was the only African-American woman on the team. And the person who was delivering the presentation read every single name on that PowerPoint except hers. And it went on. And everyone sitting in the audience, including the people on her team, no one said anything. No one said, hey, don't forget this person, right? And when she tried to bring it to her manager's attention, when she tried to talk about like just kind of the pain that she felt, the response that she got was, oh, that happens all the time. You know, we leave people off all the time. It's not a big deal. Don't make too big a deal about it. And that is one of those places where there's such a huge miss in the workplace. It's not a big deal when it's the first time it happens to you or when it happens to you rarely. But when it happens to you over and over and over and over and over again, and especially when you're part of a world where the experience that you often have is that your your input is often either not seen or like a common experience that I hear people describe is I say something in a meeting and people kind of nod and then someone else says it, a white person, a male, and it gets a lot of attention. Almost the same idea, but that person gets your attention, Right. So when we're coming from this repeated experience of not having a sense that what we're bringing is valued, it has deeper meaning. And so there was such a miss in this organization about catching her pain that it actually became much bigger. And if people had just been able to respond with empathy, wow, I really get just the longing that you have to know that your teammates have your back, right? And that they see and value your contribution and that there's a sheer desire to have you acknowledged in the same way that everyone else on the team was acknowledged and that we want to look at the introspection of why we didn't speak up in that moment. What held us back? If they had been able to do that, it would have been such a healing moment for this person and also transformative for the whole organization. So instead, they brought me in and we had to do a weeks-long circle just to get her to be seen about the pain that she was holding. And as she did it, more and more and more of the people of color that organization spoke up in ways that they hadn't before. There are two things that I'd want to say in summary about that, that incident. One is the piece that I'd named before. Notice what's preventing you from showing up fully and being with somebody to catching them fully when they tell you that something is not working. And then the other is that a lot of times, one of those racial rules that I had mentioned, I referenced earlier, is that people of color don't get to talk about the things that are bothering them. And clearly, we're living in times when more and more and more people of color are saying, no more of that rule. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to say what's bothering me. But the response that we're getting is really different. When I think about just the responses from the Capitol of Wyatts and the Black Lives Matter protests a year earlier, I actually went through and I looked at some of the news clips and took quotes from the same people. Comments for the Black Lives Matter protesters were, these are thugs. These are people who are seeking to overthrow our government. They're wrong. They're evil. Comments for the Capitol Hill riots. These are people who are finally getting their voices heard. People who are really speaking up. People who are really trying to save our government. Same person. And these were the Black Lives Matter riots who, for the most part, were incredibly peaceful, did not show up with guns, did not show up seeking to storm in and do damage to buildings, right? So there's one of these rules that says, don't speak up. And if you do, you will be punished. It's very much in force. And it shows up in our workplace. And because of those rules, people are not speaking up. So if you're a white person, and especially a white person with structural power, don't take silence as a sign that everything is okay in the workplace. Ask yourself, is it truly silence? Or is it that people are just not willing to speak, right? Is it that there's a lot stirring under the surface? It's just not 
not being noticed, not being named? And how can I get those things to surface so that we can hold it together? And another question that comes up is how have you worked with people to have them recognize when, for example, they're especially, how have you worked with white people to help them recognize when, for example, they're the ones sitting in the meeting and when a black person says an idea, they completely ignore it. And when a white person says an idea, they're like on the same page and on board and excited. I imagine that's such an unconscious thing. What are pathways to consciousness even? Yeah. So there are a number of pathways. The first is I believe strongly in the power of just raising awareness that this could even happen, right? So even just like some basic training on some of these issues starts to cue people in to start noticing, oh, am I doing that? And that's an experience that I think a lot of people have when I'm doing these trainings. They start to have these, and I actually had someone in a recent training say, in the training, oh my gosh, I just did the thing that you're talking about, which was exactly true. It's like I taught this concept and then in her response, she did exactly what I talked about, right? So having it named is really, really important. And then once it's named, and this is one of the things that I would love companies to really get, it's not sufficient to say, let's do a training. You know, we're going to do a five or six week training and everyone gets it. Then you need to practice. It's really helpful. Like some organizations have brought me in and said, sit in on our meetings and give us feedback, interrupt us, do kind of live coaching about some of these issues as they come up. And other times I've gotten recordings of meetings to look at and listen and give feedback to, or people just start noticing, like starting a culture of feedback, right? So working with organizations to set up structures where people start to feel more comfortable calling each other in. And I really named that phrase calling in versus calling out, right? Because calling in is with compassion. Calling out is from a place of stimulation and trigger. And so I don't hold calling out as bad necessarily. I just think that it takes a lot more work on the part of the person being called out to pay attention and to show up. Setting up groups and organizations where people can call each other in and support each other in noticing and changing these patterns is another avenue for change. Amazing. And I really recommend our listeners check out the article you wrote about calling in versus Mm -hmm. calling out on your website. It's so, so powerful. Thank you. Are there other articles that you could describe for our listeners that you've written that could be useful for them on their journey? I'm sure there's so come to mind. You've written <laughs> yeah. so many, I know it's <laughs> Yeah, there are quite a few on there. There's one that's in some ways it's very NVC specific, but I found that people from all over are liking it quite a lot. And I wrote it in response to the beginning of COVID, when there was so much going on, like COVID combining with the kind of growing racial awareness in the country. And I think it's called something like is NVC helpful or transformative in these times? Or how can NVC be helpful? And I think that one is really, really helpful because it talks about not just going for empathy, but just also recognizing where are the places where we might not be showing up or what are some things that we need to pay attention to that will help us understand why our colleagues our colleagues of color, our female colleagues, whatever the group is, right, might not want to say, yes, absolutely, I welcome you with open arms now that you're beginning to do this work yourself, right? So it's helping people to start looking at some of those pieces and then provide some concrete, I think, examples of ways that they could show up differently. So that might be a really good starting place for some folks. If you don't know much about NBC, I would also recommend folks to watch, I have a short video on my website that provides a like really short 40-minute introduction to some of the basic concepts of NBC. And it's kind of a general concept, not really targeted for the workplace, but I think that would be a really important place to start. And if you're interested in microaggressions, I have a few articles that are tagged that are looking at specific microaggressions and unpacking them to help people understand why was this a microaggression? And I like working with microaggressions because I think it's it provides a really concrete place for people to start noticing and applying some of these concepts, like the kind of critical awareness pieces that helps people to understand this is how I'm showing up, this is how it's painful, and here's what I can do about it. So looking at some of those articles might be a really good kind of consciousness raising place for folks. I really appreciate you bringing that in because I imagine that microaggression piece might be on a lot of our listeners' minds and awareness right now. Is there anything you'd like to share on the podcast around what you're seeing in workplaces or or a story about microaggressions? 
Yeah. So definitely microaggressions are coming up hugely in the workplace and in so many different levels, right? So with folks who are working together, it's showing up in how we talk to each other, whose work gets centered, who gets opportunities to do certain works, so, so, so many places. But it also comes up in the, and we've seen this with a lot of the Starbucks incidents, et cetera, it comes up when we're client facing, right? Who actually gets service? Who gets held to a certain standard? And so, oh, I just watched a horrendous video that took place at Victoria's Secret. I don't necessarily recommend that people watch the video, but there was something so heartbreaking about in this video, the a, a woman rushes towards an African American woman, and the African American woman keeps saying, "I'm not doing anything. I." You know, just stay away from me. I'm recording this for my safety, because if I don't record this, you're calling the police and telling them that I'm threatening you and I'm not threatening you. And when they come, they're going to assume that I threatened you. And so she records this video and then the police show up and the police say they don't actually look at the video and they don't actually ask the white woman to leave. And the woman kept saying, I did nothing wrong. Why should I leave? You should ask her to leave. And if it had been reversed, I would have been arrested, much less at some point she was eventually walked out of the store. But for me, that was a question of service in so many different places. At what point people came to this to the white woman to ask, do you need help? Are you alone? No one ever approached the black woman and said, are you feeling okay? <laughs> do you need help? So this is a question of service. How are we actually showing up to support people when more and more of these attacks are happening also? So there are a number and number of different ways that I see organizations can step in to address the different kinds of microaggressions that are showing up. But what are some of the things that, like the one key thing that I would tell your listeners, the one key thing to respond to microaggressions is to center the person with the less structural power. And that can look a number of ways. One is notice who you're going to first. Who are you talking to? Whose story are you soliciting first? Who are you listening to first, right? Notice who gets to explain their experience first. Notice whose information are you questioning? So for instance, in that scenario that I described earlier, the woman who said, I wasn't mentioned in this acknowledgement. She was questioned. It was, oh, why are you making this big deal about this? It's not a big deal. It happens to everyone, right? And also, who do we feel sorry for? Oh, this other person didn't mean to do that. It was just an accident. She didn't mean to do it. So the focus was on, oh, if we make this a big deal, that person's going to feel bad. The white person who in this case, it actually wasn't a white person, but the person who didn't read your name is going to feel bad rather than any attention to, and you feel bad, did this happen to you, right? So where are we putting our attention? Center the person who is in the historically marginalized position. Thank you so much, Roxy. Real gems that I hope will encourage folks to go and read more from from your website and your videos. So what are you working on right now that you'd like to share with listeners that maybe they could even support you with? You know, what do you need to grow your work and and how can how can listeners learn more? This is such a sweet question. <laughs> it's one of those questions that ties back to that earlier piece about my history that I shared about not attending to my needs. <laughs> and so one of the challenges that I think for a lot of business owners of color is not knowing how to ask for support, not knowing how to ask for help. So it's really sweet for me to receive this question. I've been sitting and thinking about that. And I think one of the things that's really helpful, when I share my work, I often just describe in the class that you was you were recently in, my Authentic Dialogues class, that was supporting people in gaining skills to be able to hear each other. The way that we structured that class was that we asked white folks to pay within a sliding scale, and they could, of course, ask for a scholarship if needed. But we told folks from the global majority, folks of color, that if they needed to attend a class, they can contribute whatever they wanted to contribute. And that was in recognition of the fact that, A, they would likely be sharing a lot of really painful experiences, vulnerable experiences with white folks without trusting how they would be received as folks were gaining skills in being able to respond to these things. But also that Historically, folks have less resources than white folks in this country. And 
when I do my work in this way, it means that sometimes my classes aren't funded. There were quite a number of years where we would put on a retreat. It's a social justice retreat. And we did it every year until the pandemic will be starting again next year. And we were paying to have this retreat happen because we felt the work was so important. And we wanted to ensure that folks of color could come. The, the train is actually paid to make the retreat fly. And so I would say that if you're interested in supporting my work, sign up. <laughs> if you're a person with resources, sign up. And there's always an option to sign up at a scale that would allow you to contribute to my offering tuitions or including folks without resources. And then also you can just donate and say, I have one person right now who heard me talk about this in a, in a call a year ago, and he's been contributing. It's a person of color, and I'm just so touched by this. I'm going to be doing a training in Brazil and working a lot with the Brazilian community, but they're also doing outreach to Black Brazilian folks. And he's contributing $30 a month for me to be able to pay to bring another person of color with me to learn from me and to do this work. And it's a small amount of money that won't even begin to cover even the cost of flying someone there. But just the fact that he was willing to do this was so supportive. And so if you want, if you have air miles, anything at all like that, I can use them. I always have ways to use resources to both get this training to other people and then also to support people in learning the skills and working with me and learning from me. Another place where I'm always looking for help, and I talked with you a little bit about this, is I'm really great at training. I'm horrible at like setting up my business systems. So if that's something that you're really skilled at and you'd love to donate time, reach out to me and we can talk. Amazing, Roxy. Thank you so much for bringing us back to what you are really skilled at, which is spreading this knowledge and really sharing your your wisdom, your lived experience, and also creating pathways for other folks from the global majority to share their lived experiences as well. So thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you, Erin. As we close, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners that is on your mind or that folks should be thinking of as we move towards more compassionate communication? Mm -hmm. I think just hearing you say that as we move towards, it's just, again, holding ourselves with a lot of tenderness that it is a journey and I will not always be exactly the person I want to be. And when I slip, when I fall, when people are not showing up in the way that I want, to always remember that meeting that moment with compassion makes it possible to get up and try again. So just really embracing the times when we don't show up in the ways that we want as opportunities for growth rather than failures. And if you can do that, you'll get to be exactly the person that I want the world to have more of. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.